All right, we have reached the final stage here where we just need to bring in the base ring again and attach the dragon's head to it. And we'll see if we need to make any kind of considerations um, based on the design after we do that. So I'm just going to go ahead and go to my poly mesh and import in my base ring to ZBrush file. And that's that basic ring that we had before. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just divide this a few times so it becomes nice and smooth. There is a little bit of a, a indentation line going on down here. That's sort of an imperfection from um, when I created this through NURBS, but it's it's not too much of a concern, I don't think, for me. I might just bring this down to a slightly lower subdivision level and just see what happens when I smooth this out. Eh, nah, I don't want to do that. Bring it up to four. I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. And what we're going to do now is just uh, get rid of those lower subdivision levels and go to Dynamesh and we'll put this up to the same Dynamesh subdivision level and if I hit Dynamesh now I will get most likely a problem. Let's see what that is. Actually no, this worked out pretty well. Uh, when I want to show you a problem I can't. Well here's the problem I thought was going to occur and if this occurs for you I'll show you how to fix it. Uh, oftentimes when you Dynamesh a uh, ring like this where you have a big circle it will close this hole and so you end up with uh, w without a ring anymore. Now if that's the case for you it depends on the way that you've created your ring and I basically the way we created the ring um, in Maya didn't result, re didn't result in this but if that is the case for you then what you need to do before you Dynamesh is go up to preferences and I can't really see it here on uh, the screen, so let me just get rid of these image planes real quick. Let's go back to uh, transform or texture, that's what I want. I'll pop this over here and just turn off these, uh, these image planes real quick. So uh, if I go to uh, preferences, and I come down to geometry. The issue right now is where the Dynamesh close holes is uh, set to four, and that's the default value. And if you look at this, where it says four equals small tri triangles plus projection, basically what it's doing is it's closing any hole that it detects with uh, triangles um, and any projections that it might create. What we want to do is uh, set that to zero. And then if you Dynamesh at that point and you were getting closed holes before, you will now no longer have any closed holes. I'm just going to set that back to 4 because that's actually quite helpful in case we do get any tearing in the mesh uh, that it automatically resolves that for us. So what I'm going to do is come back to my dragon head and I'm going to go to my subtool and I'm going to append to this the base ring. Now we can see that this matches up pretty well and if I were to go back to that image plane again, you see that um, what we have here is not 100% perfect in terms of the original concept, but that's okay, it's close enough. I'm not going to really follow the concept here. In fact, I'm not really going to make a bony or scaly kind of ring. Um, I'll explain why here in just a moment. I'm just going to go back to here, and what I want to do is close the gaps here. Now, I could um, either try to model that down, but I think the quickest way to do that would just be to go into the move tool and just move this head just so it's resting more on top of the ring there like that and that looks pretty good I think that's just about where we want it. If I look underneath here there's no interpenetration so that's good. Uh, basically now what I just need to do is blend this part of the um, sculpt into the ring itself so I'm just going to start using things like the move tool here to do that. I'll just start pushing some of this down and I'm not too worried about this neck being all that visible. I'm actually going to end up having this interpenetrate down there for the moment but um, I will resolve that here shortly. So this is a little bit different than what we had in the um, original uh, concept but that's for the sake of comfort and just for the sake of design. This is a pretty darn thick design up here. I mean that's a lot of, um, a lot of metal we're just going to have to deal with that fact. Um, some people might go in and actually uh, hollow out underneath here, but for the sake of example, I'm just going to 
leave it as it is. It's going to result in a relatively heavy ring, and that's just something that we need to be aware of. Before I combine these two together, I am just going to go underneath here. I'll grab my uh, hard polish brush, and I'll push back a little bit so that we don't end up having any of that poke through there. All right. So um, the reason why I am not keen on necessarily continuing a scale pattern around the ring has to do with the way that I intend on printing this ring. And that is where I have a um, support structure down here. And this is thing I would generate in um, a, a program dedicated for the 3D printer, for example. And if I had scales down there, it would be very difficult to um, get a reliable support. Um, if it's flat, if it's basically um, something that is mostly continuous as this is, it's a lot easier to get the um, uh, to, to get a support on the base. Also, uh, beyond that, usually, at least in our 3D printer, uh, what results is a little bit of um, teeth residue, because uh, there's actually little teeth that get created here for the supports. And if you take those teeth off, um, you need to then, once this gets cast in metal, actually kind of grind those teeth back a bit. And so if you're polishing that back and there was detail there, you're actually going to start polishing into that detail as well and you will lose some of it. So it's best in my mind to just kind of keep this nice and simple. It allows us to not have to go into much more detail um, in this tutorial than, than what we really need to. And I think right about now is a good time to um, start combining these two things together, these two pieces together. The only one section that is probably worth our consideration is uh, what's hanging over here. Just because if you look at this from the side, purely from a comfort point of view, this might dig into somebody's flesh a bit, right? So even though this wasn't the way it was created in the um, concept, I am going to use some sort of ergonomic considerations here and just push these uh, sort of spiny bits up a little bit so that they don't dig into somebody's skin. Because remember, this is going to be made in, uh, in my case, I'm going to make this in sterling silver. So, you know, it's a, it's a metal and it could be quite uncomfortable. So we want somebody to, to enjoy wearing this ring and not um, think that it's a bit of a chore or, you know, or, or, or draws blood, for instance. So um, just checking underneath here, is this? No, there is no. Um, uh, I thought maybe there was a hole there, but there isn't, so that's fine. OK, so let's go ahead and combine these two pieces together. This is a relatively simple thing. Um, I have the. Um, main head here, underneath it as a subtool I have the ring. And I'm just going to go ahead and go to merge and merge down and say yep, go for it. Okay, so now if I just uh, control click drag, we will eventually recalculate this as a single dynamesh. Okay, now the, the one thing I need to point out about having done that is uh, in order for this to work correctly, at least one of uh, these subtools needs to have been a Dynamesh, and preferably the one on top. Uh, of course, we've been working in Dynamesh all along, so that's not a problem, but it is worth pointing out. Now, if I start going in here and trying to smooth this around, what can happen is I can start getting some um, noise, or I can get some um, movement on the back side of this. Uh, ring. So that's not exactly what I want. Let's go ahead and see. Actually, that was caused by the Dynamesh, sorry. Sometimes um, if I do too much movement here, though, I will get a little bit of um, change on this underside of the ring, which is not what I want. And just to avoid that, what I'll do is just for the current brush that's selected, I would want to go into, uh, let's just do this with the clay brush, go into um, brush and come down to auto masking and turn on back face masking. So uh, what this is good for, if you've never used this before, is in case you have a situation where you have a really thin piece, for example, uh, and you are trying to sculpt on one side, you might actually end up grabbing some of the faces on the back side and moving them with that sculpted motion. Back face masking hopefully allows you to just grab what's on the front side and ignore what's on the back side. So I'm just going to kind of sculpt this down a little bit more in here. Sort of gradually blend this in. So it looks like it more or less just naturally emerges from the ring itself. 
that's pretty good. Um, I'm just going to come in. There's a lot of jagged edges here from the Dynamesh. I'm just going to go in with a much more localized smooth brush and just smooth that out. This detail is so fine that it's likely you will not see it. And um, I mean, the truth is that it really comes down to what is the resolution of the 3D printer that you intend to use. There's all different kinds of 3D printers, and many of them have a very poor resolution. You know, you're, you get a lot of those at home 3D printers, um, things like the MakerBots and, and stuff like that, and they're, they're cool, but honestly, they're not very good in terms of resolution. So, especially in terms of uh, what you'd want for jewelry, jewelry needs to have a very, very high resolution. So, the um, 3D printer that we use is made by Envision Tech and it's called a Micro. And the, the Micro is uh, pretty darn good. Uh, it's got a resolution down to 25 microns uh, in terms of uh, each layer that it prints in the uh, Z direction. So that is uh, really, really fine and works really, really well for jewelry, jewelry purposes. You really don't even see the individual layers that are being printed. Now that's a, that's a 3D printer that prints in a wax resin, and so we use basically a direct wax casting where that wax resin gets put into um, some investment, which is like plaster basically, and it gets heated up, the wax melts away, and what's left behind is this nice um, negative space that is the, you know, the opposite of what the ring looks like right now. So you fill that negative space in with molten sterling silver, for example, or gold, or whatever your, your metal type is. Um, and then it hardens and you have this nice ring. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up the, uh, the sculpting process here. I'm going to go ahead and, um, and, and give this a test print now just to see how it comes out. The places where I might have some concern, and we'll see if this is actually the, any problems with the print, um, when we're dealing with a 3D print and you're dealing with something that really is going to be you know, really quite tiny. I mean, this is going to be something about this size, you know, on my screen right now. I'm putting my finger up to the to the ring, and that's about life size for me. You can see that much of that detail that we had invested in earlier is quite difficult to see. So uh, this is why, even in the concept drawing, I had Sanjana um, sort of make the eyes and nostrils a bit bigger, and there's some of this other detail here that surely we might end up losing. Uh, that being said, the 3D printer that I'm working with is really quite uh, quite good at picking up detail, but I might need to push things a little bit more, like uh, some of these indentations around the scales around the mouth, for example. I might want to go in and just sort of push that in a bit more. I'm just going to do that right now, just because I know that's going to be uh, an issue. And um, the, even the little amounts that I'm changing right now probably aren't enough, but we'll see what we get. So sometimes, you know, when you're when you're thinking about um, 3D printing, for example, especially 3D printing something quite small like this, you have to bear in mind what it's going to look like in uh, in the real world scale that it's being printed at versus you know the sort of infinite magnification that you can do in ZBrush. That means that sometimes certain aspects of the of the face need to be purposefully made larger, and uh, you might actually need to deepen or exaggerate uh, surface details as well. Okay, so uh, the final step that I need to do here besides saving this, which is always a good idea, I don't know what I just saved that as. <laughs> accidentally hit the wrong key. Hope I didn't save it as something, ah, I just saved it as this. I'll save it as something properly named actually. There we go. Um, the last thing I need to do in order to get uh, this model out and brought over into my uh, the software that I would use to actually 3D print it from. And this is the same kind of step that you would want to use if you're going to be sending it to somebody's 3D printer or maybe you have your own 3D printer. Most likely the file format that you're going to be exporting it out as is going to be an STL. And you don't necessarily want to export out all of this geometry. I mean 603,000 polygons isn't too bad, right? I mean, in ZBrush, we can go up to millions of polygons, but ultimately, uh, we're really not going to pick up that much detail in the 3D print. So 603,000 polygons isn't too bad, but I can still make this a bit more optimized, and I'm going to start doing that by going to my Z plugin and go to Decimation Master, 
and I'll just pre-process this. So I might let that calculate. Almost done. Okay. And now we're just going to go and let's just take the default value of 20% and see what we get. Okay, we should notice actually no apparent uh, change on the surface here, but we do have 238,000 polygons now. Um, so the our, we still have a fairly high density mesh there. Let's just try pulling this down. I like to pull it down kind of like large amounts and see if it makes any difference. So I'll pull this down to something like 5% decimate current. Now that's a fairly noticeable difference and that's giving us uh, 59,000 polygons. So I think instead, let's try somewhere in between. Let's try 10%. Okay. Um, now this looks pretty pretty changed from what we had seen before at 20%. But the question is, is it changed enough that it makes any difference when it's scaled down this size? And I think the answer to that is no. So that's probably okay to work with. Um, just notice sort of a little bit of a tear going on there, so I just smoothed that out. And I think that that will be fine. I don't think we're really losing any kind of critical detail by doing this, and that's giving us just over 100,000 polygons. Okay. So I'm going to export this out. Now, um, the file format that I want to get this into is an STL. But um, the issue that, that I have with this is that um, if I try using the built-in 3D print exporter here, and I convert between you know, inches or millimeters or whatnot, um, this is setting this to a specific size, and I don't know the exact dimension on this ring, to be honest. I know what the dimension is from here to here, probably, but I don't really know what this dimension is from here to here. It's a little bit longer, a little bit wider than I originally would intend. So if I were to export this out, um, I'm going to end up with a ring that's not necessarily the size that I want it to be. Right? Even though it says original size and all that stuff, I find this is not the most um, reliable way to export. So what I do, maybe I'm just doing it wrong, <laughs> and that's fine, but uh, what I do is this. I will go to just export, and I'll export it as an OBJ. Very, very simple. So if I just go and find um, where I've been saving everything else, uh, we'll just save this out as uh, the dragon head ring finished. Okay, um, And then I'll just use another software in between to convert the OBJ to an STL. In my case, I use a software called NetFab, and that's just a nice and simple um, free software you can download. Let's load that up here to show you. And um, I mean, you could do this in Maya if you have the right um, plugins and whatnot as well. So I just um, open up the file in question. So, 3D World. So you can see that you know when you're working with this stuff, it's I end up using a lot of software. I probably use more software than I need to, but I know you know the the point is is that this stuff is so uh, precise. You need it to be so precise that you don't want to make any mistakes. So I use a workflow that I know absolutely works and um, I don't have to worry about it printing at the wrong size, for example. So this is just uh, a, you know, this is just what it looks like in NetFab, and I would just export this out as an STL, and then save in the same folder, and there we go. I would have the STL ready to go to send to the person who I want to 3D print this. In this case, I'm 3D printing it, and um, yeah, I will uh, carry on and, and hopefully be able to show in the tutorial as well uh, you know some examples of what this looks like when it's actually printed and any kind of concerns that we might have as a result.